is, and that will give you an idea of what this all was like, and why your grandfathers, fathers, or great-grandfathers, I guess for some of you, did such a noble, wonderful, human, unbelievable thing when they rescued us. They tied the bosun, they tied a uh, the line around me, pulled me up the cliff. Also, I thought all these people were giants, fleeing a hundred men up the cliff, and they all looked to me like they were six foot eight, big soldiers. And then when they came to our 40 years later, there was Mr. Drake, who was one of them. He was as small as I was, and I couldn't believe that they had the strength to do that. And when I got up to the on the edge of the cliff, uh, first reaction was, wow. And then all of a sudden I realized that next to me lying on the cliff was a man named Mangum, who was one of my reserve outfit, who was a friend of mine. And we had had a little talk that the doctor gave us at the shore from the olives. And we were only supposed to have one swallow. I think Magna took a little swallow and lying there and I went to help him and he was dead. Now, think what it was like to have your friend alongside and, and think of what it was like to feel people who appeared out of nowhere suddenly gave you back your life. Well, what of the one of your grandparents, parents, great grandparents, took me by the arm and carried me up the slope where they had a little park and maybe there were 40 or 50 men being dismounted. Left me there, went back to get pulling the sun. And my feeling at the time when I was at the fire, I was going fine. And I didn't realize that the heavy oil, snow and the ice, was making me what I guess they call noble. And it hurt. And I decided I had enough of this. So I was going home. And I was going home to see my wife. And started to the snow to go home to New York. <laughs> yeah. Fortunately, the navigator that saw me wandered off and got up and walked me back to the fire. Now, one of the things that was so wonderful about your people, about the Newfoundland that were there that night, is in the cold, in this ice, not only was there this wonderful grave, but they were taking off their own clothes, their gloves, their sweater, and so forth, to put them on us, because a lot of us didn't have clothes. So you can't imagine the degree of, uh, well, the only word I know is uh, the degree of humanity that people would have who just say thank us for our bravery. We weren't brave at all. We were like like cats sort of stumbling around and then all that means she people saved all of us. And uh, I can tell you it was a wonderful thing. Is that Thank 
Okay, but I have to tell you this. I don't want to disturb you, but your afternoon is my morning. It's now 9.30 morning here. So I'm going to say good morning to you. To your afternoon. I'm going to be crazy. I'm not. Uh, well, let's see. Uh, first of all, I think I was, oh, I think I was a little crazy <laughs> at that time uh, because a lot of it is vague to me. And as I said, I was a bit crazy because I was going to walk back to the city to see my wife. And uh, the next thing I really knew was that it was dawn. And... Uh, we were all kind of huddled around this little fire, and a working party, a nasty working party, of a doctor and a couple of men came up and they soup. But the soup was in the pans, and obviously St. Lawrence to uh, the cliff the hot soup and the cold soup and then almost into frozen soup. But by this time we were so thirsty, so hungry, with our oily hands we dug into the soup, put it in our mouths like kind of like monkey to do. <laughs> <laughs> what happened to me is uh, I know what was saying. I knew I was very comfortable, uh, and I didn't know what was going to happen. And now, more than uh, 24 hours, gone by. It's a long time, and the snow is still snowing, the wind is blowing, was freezing cold, had been all this time. Yet these people helped helped us a little bit. I think it's close one. And they both both would like it. <coughs> Excuse me. And the next thing I I got a sled. That was like a sled I never saw before, which wouldn't. I both started to hold up two and had a that really was a little plus and a wonderful man who put me on the sled, took me down to the mine, St. Lawrence. <coughs> when we got to the mine, first of all, it was warm. That was hard to breathe. Secondly, there were wonderful women there. And we were so covered with, t with oil, probably, it was close to a half an inch thick, but skin, which may also have helped keep blood from freezing to death because they all made it come. And the wood had hot rocks. They us, took the oil off us, and I couldn't do it. Somehow, maybe I had died and I was in heaven. And, uh, it was so wonderful. And then the next thing I knew, I was taken to a house that, where people by the name of Rose lived. And I was put in a warm bed, I was part of and uh, I was there, I guess, slow come to. Finally, I was later the next sentence and came on the destroyer and I took to the hospital. Attention. 
And it was very strange because my last name was not. And I why I couldn't say. And there was an office came um, and uh, took a look at me and said, Hey! And it was a friend of mine from Long Island, St. Anson, it was Alex Strapp. And here I was a the destroyer friend who had the same name that they had. Um, but that's funny. Instead of thinking, here's a good friend of mine who had the same name. That's funny, he's got the same name I have. <laughs> They led me off the street, and they led me into the hospital. And I was looking for 45 still, because I was blind, and I thought I was blind, because nobody told me that I was eventually be taken care of, and I killed myself, because I couldn't imagine going home blind. And uh, the day, Whatever they did with my eyes, it was fine. It just kept burning, but that was it. And I thought, here I am now, in a hospital, in our dentist. How did it all happen? And then gradually I began to realize what went on. And I had sort of thought of like, maybe for 10 hours. And I guess that's an ancient way of healing the mind a little bit. Do you have any other questions? No, that's all. Thank you, Mr. Schwartz. I can't wait. I can see you all. Listen, hey. this is a wait. wonderful event. <laughs> a good question because you all sitting there have to realize that the reason that I'm sitting here is because of your ancestors and the reason why I had life after 1942 is because of your fathers, grandfathers and great grandfathers. So I'm pretty humble about it and it affected my life two ways. The politics affected my life because for quite a while I s held on to the lifelines deciding that I was not going to go in the water again. I'd been in the water once and I knew that was death. Watching friends of mine die and uh, fighting it somehow or other the feeling now that I think of that, the feeling I had wasn't like the feeling you would expect to have when you see friends, a couple of them that you went to high school with, uh, die in front of them. Because at the same time, trying to figure out from the currents and the waves and whatnot, is there a way that you could go in and be saved? And it was only later on that the real feel about friends dying to me. And it hit me hard because I, for whatever the reasons, didn't seem to make any difference. One of my friends let a good luck die, or whether one of my friends had a bad life and died. There seemed to be no time or reason in it. So I thought about quite a bit. But anyway, um, what happened is I was given a commission and was a consultant. 
and uh, they were they were there to push and do. And the uh, so I said, "Yep, what have you been and seeing? You have experience." Thank you. I don't like the chairman. And he said, "Well, how would you like to be able to see your wife fight the chairman?" Him to her. I said, yeah, well, that'd be nice. She said, well, suppose I took you on a submarine chase. Uh, and uh, I was to marine school. And basically in New York, you'll be able to fight the dirt for three days a week, be in New York one day a week. I said, okay, that's a deal. And that was the test of power to check school. And all of a sudden, halfway to the school, oh, by the commander, and he said, we have to find the executive officer, the SC-668, and you're going aboard as executive officer. I said, I haven't been half to the school. I don't even know the senior officer got to the school. I asked, he said, uh, you're the executive person. That's how I got to be a subject. And we read Convoy when they were sinking taxes ship all of Florida. And then uh, went to the Solomon Islands, Guadalcanal, and it was at the year and half, and fought the Japanese for war. And uh, got command of the subject. And eventually, after almost two years out there, I came back and I taught navigation. But one of the things that I found out, because when you're a small ship, means the big ships out there. So the big ship lost the man like a commissioner in a battle. They transferred your country and replaced him with his pilot. So I had a trip between the middle of the zone and all this time. And I found that if you explain how many fire, how many bullets fired in the time it took you to clear an airman gun, all before you started training, did you train people in half the time? And I wrote a report about this that took the Washington, the Bureau of Ships, to Sydney if they could do something with production because Germany had surrendered. People thought what was but yet being killed all over Okinawa and the And the film is an emotional meeting. And the only way I found that you could prove it emotionally, not in lecture. And therefore we expert. And after the war, I don't think that some of the Pollocks said that very closely that whatever I did, I ought to do now. So oh, I started the after all, as did the strikes, but no longer felt they took importance, so they didn't have that good of a of the jobs. And uh, I started making all the corporations that helped make people feel their jobs, whether it was a telephone operator, whether it was a supervisor, had a point themselves, even though it wasn't the saving world anymore. And I did a lot of trick, human relations, communications and industry. Very big companies like IBM and AT&T. And I was able to get a lot of satisfaction people in the workplace, what I was doing. A good part of it resulted from at the experience what your ancestors like 
in terms of a human spin. And instead of really being just competitive, I felt co-opted in a society more important. And that was a lesson I learned to do. And that was a very important lesson. And to this day, I am so happy I learned it because I also made films in countries for Pan American now. And the films I made in the country started in 1950 helped to bring understanding in the United States of in Japan, Tahiti, and New Zealand, Britain. So, it's a very important thing. And I... that I've learned that you don't have to be a big majority, that every single person can have an impact on either another person or a large group as you all had on my group. And thank you very much.
How the mighty have fallen, like the ancient poet said. This earth and air with its thoughts, like hell, cling to us this golden day. By the means that he chose to deliver, though not yet meant to die. What may be God by the grace of God for all that grace of life? Yeah, two 
laptops and several new pieces of equipment for our music program as well. That's just the beginning of what your generosity is going to bring back to us. for the opportunity to do that. I feel that this, <laughs> this has been so great I can't really describe it. And I hope that uh, the equipment does the things it should do. Thank you.